Hello and welcome to So Much For Pathos, the show that gives Hollywood a Chelsea grin with a credit card that's £2,000 overdrawn. I'll be your detective of this evening. Now, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but I am an Englishman. England is a curious little island nation in terms of the film industry. We don't really have what one would consider a studio system or any real centralised way of raising funds for filmmaking. Most feature films that get made in the UK are usually for a collection of private investors or are financed through production houses such as BBC Films or Film 4. And even then, receiving outsourced money from other production houses in and around the UK is not uncommon. As such, most films in the United Kingdom tend to also be in part be funded with American money, and that's largely due to the government's generous tax return policy on film productions in the UK, which basically states that a British production has the ability to apply for a tax rebate which will refund one third of the production budget, although the loose definition of what technically constitutes a British production according to the government means that Britain is largely a one million dollar subsidiary to the United States. Suffice it to say, it's sometimes quite difficult to find a film made in the UK with British money. All the movies we've covered thus far are American, and a large proportion of our audience are American, so I thought it'd be nice to try and mix things up and talk about a production that is definitively British. And thus I present to thee, The Football Factory. But first, the case notes. The Football Factory is a 1997 novel by John King which dealt with the lives of a group of working class Londoners who follow Chelsea FC and engage in violent altercations with the firms of other football teams. The book caused a bit of a stir upon its initial release due to its graphic content which made it a bestseller by word of mouth. Soon afterwards a bidding war for the film rights to an adaptation took place with Nick Love, the eventual director, trying to purchase the rights for himself. The rights eventually landed in the hands of Alan Niblo, who at the time had just finished production on Human Traffic, and his producing partner James Richardson. There was a stipulation, however, that the film had to be directed by a friend of John King, to which Doug Ray Scott and Sean Bean later attached to be involved. Unfortunately, the production collapsed on the first weekend when Alan Niblo and James Richardson found themselves unhappy with the dailies and decided to close the production down. Reeling with only 290000 of their initial £500,000 budget left, they turned to Nick Love who was in the middle of development hell for another project and asked him if he could take on the film whilst the producers convinced the initial investors that they could put together the movie again from scratch with what they had left. Within a week, Nick Love had written a brand new draft of the script and the producers were able to raise some more money for the film by the time they reached post-production. With a new budget of a little over £635,000 and Rockstar Games coming on on board as executive producers whose level of involvement in the project isn't entirely clear. The Football Factory was released in May of 2004, time to coincide with the climax of the domestic season and the prelude to England's participation in the 2004 UEFA Championship. Its release was received by critics with mixed reception at the time, but the film later found its home on DVD where it began to accrue a cult audience of devoted fans, largely thanks to a pirate copy of the film leaking during its theatrical run that created much excitement and anticipation. It's something of a favourite here in Britain, and seeing as it's at least 10 years old, I thought it'd be as good a time as any to revisit it and see if it's any good. So let's investigate, shall we? The Football Factory stars Danny Dyer as Tommy Johnson, a shallow, bitter white male approaching 30 who hates his job and lives exclusively for the weekend. The weekend, which variably consists of either clubbing, drinking, having casual sex or taking drugs, is mostly centred around being part of the Chelsea FC firm, which follows the club as supporters for both home and away games, organising large-scale fights with the opposing clubs away from the grounds on game day. The film is split into a series of subplots where the characters are packaged together into groups, with Tommy's internal monologue and character arc acting as the central drive that holds the film together on a narrative level. Tommy and his best friend Rod share a subplot together as they spend their weekends going out drinking and taking part in casual sex, though not with each other sadly, until Tommy causes a stir by unknowingly having sex with a girl that turns out to be the sister of one of the top guys in the Millwall FC firm, whom have had a legendary rivalry with Chelsea in the past. Rod also gets his own subplot involving him going out with a middle class barrister from Penge, who Rod met when he, Tommy and Billy were arrested during a trip up north to an away game. Their relationship somewhat peeves Tommy, who feels a sense of robbery from his close friendship with Rod. In the meantime, Billy Bright shares a subplot with Harris, the leader of the Chelsea firm, along with Zebedee and Raph, a couple of thieving base heads who are new recruits to the firm. Billy, like Tommy, struggles with of a midlife crisis and envies that Zebedee looks up to Harris and not him. And in the background of the proceedings there's a subplot between two elderly war veterans, Albert and Grandad, because we're being clever, who observe the surrounding drama and plan to move to Australia to escape and retire, plans which are unfortunately cut short when Albert unexpectedly passes away and leaves Grandad stranded in England by himself. All three subplots converge when the Premier League Cup draw places Chelsea against Millwall to play a match, which ignites the legendary feud between the two firms as the characters prepare for a firm v firm mass rock on game day. The central thrust of the movie is essentially about a group of predominantly white heterosexual men, either in or approaching their 30s, feeling weighed down by the perceived emasculated culture that surrounds them as they attempt to reclaim their manhood through blood and sweat. To that end, the movie is not too dissimilar from Fight Club, except with only 10% of the humour and negative 100% the irony. So, let's lay our cards on the table. The Football Factory is rather messily put together, but it is at least functional. What I mean is that the movie structure is a tad flimsy, with subplots going in and out of the narrative whenever they feel needed to propel the story forward, and consequently create some rather awkward tone shifts. It feels somewhat disjointed and rough around the edges, largely down to a muddy final story edit that has the competency to put together 
together a clear beginning and end point, but without much in the way of a concrete middle act to hold both ends together, which creates the bizarre problem of not having any particular sense of build towards the climax. The ending of the first act is officially signalled after all the characters are properly introduced when Chelsea and Millwall are drawn to play a game against each other, creating a sense of foreshadowed doom ahead for all of the characters. But then what proceeds to happen is that the narrative bears itself down with interchangeable subplots that function more like individual sketches rather than straightforward plotting, before the film finally decides it's game day, at which point we get our big final mass fist fight to climax the film. That having been said, the movie paces itself with a freneticism and sense of drive that none of that really bothers you whilst you're stuck in the middle of it. So the fact that the stakes of the story are largely ignored in the second act are combated with story pacing that maintains an overall well-honed sense of narrative flow. So I suppose what you could say is that The Football Factory is rather competently put together in spite of a particularly iffy screenplay, the details of which we'll be getting into in a minute, but first we need to lay some ideas on the table so then we're all on board. For starters, let's talk about toxic masculinity. Toxic masculinity refers to the socially constructed attitudes that describes the masculine gender role as violent, unemotional, sexually aggressive and so forth. It's a very harmful social script that offers a narrow definition of manhood that excludes anything that isn't considered manly, assuming that all things and experiences have inherent binary male-female coding. This concept tends to also leak over into other areas, even if you're not familiar with toxic masculinity specifically, you will have almost certainly have heard of its offshoots. Boys will be boys, men think about sex every seven seconds, men can't be friends with women because they will inevitably try and have sex with every woman, and so on. Now it's difficult to talk about toxic masculinity because some people tend to misunderstand the term as condemning all masculinity as if manhood itself is inherently bad, but that's not the case. What we're referring to when we talk about toxic masculinity is specifically the aggressive gender policing of male identity. This is the kind of thinking that gives us ideas like pink is for girls and blue is for boys, despite both colours being arbitrary. The aim of toxic masculinity is to reward aggression and violence as masculine standards whilst diminishing passivity and excluding men who don't adhere to the societal standard. It's a very real problem which holds men to unreachably high standards and excludes a wide array of experiences for not being sufficiently macho. Experiences like, say, men who prefer to take a passive role in their sex lives and men who are openly effeminate, or indeed men who are emotional. Men like me, for example. See please, men who are openly effeminate. It's generally acknowledged by psychologists and mental health experts that men are far more likely to commit suicide than women, and it's been suggested that this is because of the cage of toxic masculinity. In other words, it's a worldview that polices masculinity by enforcing rules such as being emotionally unavailable and always being ready to commit violence. Particularly in the case of the football factory, the idea that a real man is one who's ready to get violent at a moment's notice is one that is fairly prevalent in British working class culture. And the movie's protagonist makes his opinion on the matter loud and clear. What else are you going to do on a Saturday? Sit in your fucking armchair wanking off to pop idols? Then try and avoid your wife's gaze as you struggle to come to terms with your sexless marriage. Then go and spunk your wages on kebabs, fruit machines and brasses. Fuck that for a laugh. I know what I'd rather do. Trot them away. Love it. The movie frames Tommy Johnson as it's normal put upon every man. He works a dead-end job, drinks beer, takes drugs and is slowly slipping away from his youth. And in a bid to hold on to his youth, feeling his manhood slip away as he approaches 30, he engages in football violence to fill a need that regular adult life doesn't provide for him. And with that, the film sets us up to meet the surrounding characters who are all more or less in the same emotional and societal position, particularly Billy Bright, who appears to be in the situation that Tommy describes in the opening. The thing about all of the characters together, however, is that none of them actually have lost any sense of their manhood. Based on their actions and the way that they conduct themselves outside of fights, no one would look at these men and see them as insufficiently macho, so it's not so much a case of them reclaiming a sense of lost manhood as is simply looking for permission to be aggressive. Football violence allows them to do that, it enables their behaviour and rewards their need to prove their own misplaced sense of what defines a man through primal embrace of violence. Possibly the most broken aspect is that it reflects a focus on proving you're a man as opposed to a woman. It doesn't work out at all, since manhood and womanhood have so much overlap you have to exclude most positive or kind behaviour to be a man on that basis. And it still doesn't make you a man. It makes you masculine, but a three-year-old boy is masculine. He isn't a man and neither are any of the lads in the firm. Because manhood isn't just masculinity. A man isn't defined as not a woman. You become a man when you stop being a boy, and none of the members of the firm have ever done that. Tommy is still a boy, he's still playing with boys, still afraid of girls, still afraid of responsibility and family, of defining his own identity, of building a real life for himself and discovering a sense of purpose. This firm is a lot like one of the campy street gangs from West Side Story. It gives a fake sense of importance to overgrown children who feel ignored and powerless, entirely based on bullshit appropriated military rhetoric and machismo. A good example of this is during the subplot where Rod starts going out of Tamara, the barrister whom Rob was flirting with during their trial. I'm just going to skim over the fact that she's only one of two female characters in the story that actually has a significant role beyond just being a partner to one of the male characters, simply because that's its own can of worms and we don't have time. Tommy's feelings towards her are that she is an invader, an outsider, trying to take Rod away from football. It's weird that there's so much casual sex in the film and yet the moment when Rod finds himself with a girlfriend that it's suddenly the end of the world for Tommy. The way that the characters other women as being poisoners of perceived male spaces, and the way that the characters feel that the organised violence 
importance of game day as what makes them men, because an embrace of emotions other than anger makes them weak, this is toxic masculinity. Ironically, the older, greyer children in the firm idolise men like Grandad and Albert who fought in the war, and view themselves in the same kind of terms, using military language and ideas such as comradeship and heroism. But these actual veterans despise them because they take pride not in the violence of war, nor the jingoism the wanky local taxi driver is attracted to. This country was built on good people like yourselves. Not enough of you about, that's what I say. But in having stops, the very sort of brutal fascists the football firms represent. Grandad and Albert function as the Greek chorus of the piece, looking upon the actions of the other characters with derision, and their attitude towards the group fighting wars as being entirely without substance. An unspoken joke of the film is that if Tommy really wants to aspire to a traditional conception of manhood, Grandad stands right there the whole time as a perfectly acceptable positive example of a real man. A character who has fought for something greater than himself, or his own gratification, who has made a family, who is confident and comfortable in himself, who is loyal to his friends, and who stands up for what he believes in. You don't even know you're fucking born. Oh, fuck off. It's not like Tommy has no better examples, there's one right here. But Tommy lacks the courage to break out of his toxic lifestyle in favour of growing up, represented by Grandad's offer to take him to Australia with him. He dreams of a family, but we know that he'll never have one, because in his current state he's scared of girls and doesn't know how to interact with them when he isn't drunk. And it's interesting to witness the generation gap that emerges between the older characters and the younger characters play out through the shifting perspective. As we said before, there's something to be said about the way the current generation of hooligans look up to the older generation with respect, and yet they appropriate the value system of their ancestors to suit their own violent tendencies, misunderstanding understanding said value system in the first place. The difference is, Grandin and Albert had a war to fight, they had a cause to give their life for, they had a place in the world that involved them defending their country's value system. The lads in the firm don't have any of that, and yet they feel a compulsion to give themselves over to the cause of proving one's own self-worth, and by extension one's own masculinity. This is the mentality of a cargo cult, a mentality descended from their forefathers as a sacred tradition to be upheld. The violence that the characters indulge in is seen as noble and courageous, whilst remaining uncritical of the underlying assumption as to why they engage in the behaviour that they do. The misplaced sense of priority instilled in them from the generation that came before leads them to create a concentrated microcosm of society in which masculine expectations are aggressively policed, and anything and anyone that does not conform is seen as sub-ideal. What's fascinating is that there's a moment when Albert passes away and we see the group attending his funeral. There's an exchange between Billy and Zebedee in which Billy criticises Zebedee's presence there as being unwanted, largely on account of him being one of the younger members in the group. The idea at play here is that Zebedee is inexperienced when it comes to organised fighting, and thus the act of him paying his respects as one person to another is unwelcome and irrelevant because he's not seen real warfare. The irony of this scene is of course neither has Billy, because it's an utter fallacy to compare what happens on game day between football hooligans and what took place in the Normandy landings. And once again we come back to the framing problem with the Dark Knight. The football factory doesn't really have a coherent sense of what it means to say about its central characters. There's stuff in here that the movie certainly disapproves of. Billy Bright towards the third act starts to be portrayed as a liability, which leads to a moment where he questions his own sense of self. And Tommy is perpetually stuck throughout the film in a cycle of self-doubt in regards to whether or not the life he's chosen is worth it. But the main tonal thrust of the film is that it's a comedy sort of. It attempts to criticise the violence it portrays on screen, whilst also revelling in said violence for the purposes of entertaining the viewer. It's a difficult task to balance in any case, but the football factory appears to embrace both stools with both hands and fucks itself over as a result. And the key problem is that as the characters remain uncritical of their actions, the movie remains uncritical too. The ending in particular has this problem, because after a full hour's worth of contemplation about Tommy's withstanding on his place in the world, his ultimate quest, and the conclusion he draws, doesn't amount to much. After all that, you really do have to ask yourself if it was all worth it. Of course it fucking was. So basically what we've experienced for the entirety of the movie is a bunch of guys going around beating people up for no reason other than they support another football team, indulging in binge drinking and casual misogyny, with no conclusive point to be made about their lives. It is entirely possible to create a narrative where the central character learns absolutely nothing about themselves along their journey. After all, movies like Happy Go Lucky and Young Adults actually work as well as they do precisely because of their lack of character inspection, where the narrative is built more so around the supporting characters adjusting to the protagonist's unshakable worldview. But you don't get that with The Football Factory because all the characters are already in a place where everyone conforms to everyone else's perspective. The only characters who are critical of the protagonist are the elderly characters and Tamara, who uniformly don't get enough screen time and are shockingly passive within the main discourse. And my biggest gripe isn't that the Football Factory supports a worldview I don't believe in. As Roger Ebert famously said, it's not what a movie's about, it's how it goes about it. So what I'm getting at here is that the movie's overall lukewarm approach to self-introspection and criticism leads to a scenario in which we're meant to cheer on a group of characters whom we have no reason to do so because they're all total bastards. An issue which is only further compounded by the framing problem. Now, would it be possible for me to think of a movie that has similarly despicable characters and it actually is properly framed. Um, train spotting. Choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career. Choose a family. 
Choose a fucking big television. Choose washing machines, cars, compact displays and electrical tin openers. In Train Spotting, the characters most central to the plot are all terrible and do terrible things. They're irresponsible, they steal things from people, they neglect a baby. At one point Renton single-handedly fucks up someone's relationship and then gets them on heroin when they break up, inadvertently causing that character's death. But the difference maker is that the movie is correctly framed by acknowledging wholeheartedly that their actions are horrible and we as audience members aren't expected to like them for their horribleness. And on top of that, all the characters suffer consequences for their actions, which is what causes Renton to eventually clean himself up, cut himself off from the leeches he has for friends and take a chance on choosing life. What happens in The Football Factory, by contrast, is that Tommy worries about whether or not his life is worth it, he attends the game day fight with Millwall, which puts him in the hospital, and comes out of it without any change of heart at all, accepting the cycle of violence as naturalistic and his injuries as heroic badges of honour. And in this context, he does technically suffer for his actions, coming away from hospital with a broken leg, but he just accepts his punishment for engaging in violence as being part of a man, without having the forethought of the serious long-term damage said violence will eventually do to him, like it clearly has to Billy Bright. That sense of natural trial by fire, of willingly punishing oneself to prove one's worth, and of remaining uncritical of the serious mental and physical damage that tolls on a person and feeling not allowed to speak up for it for fear of being seen as weak or sub-ideal, is the cage of toxic masculinity. And the other problem is, to use the train spotting analogy, at no point do we ever see Tommy risk choosing life. What we do see instead is Tommy indulging in violence, casual sex and drug taking. But the problem is that the movie doesn't establish a baseline of normal for the film's contrast his questionable actions alongside of. At least with this movie's long distance ideological cousin Fight Club, we know exactly what Jack, the narrator, is fighting against when he chooses to start the titular underground boxing club with Tyler. He's in his 30s, he works a dead end job and lives in an apartment full of items that are of no value to him, which he views as indicative of a perceived feminisation of his culture, and thus Fight Club is created. Even though Jack's viewpoint is utterly unfounded and that Fight Club is merely a refuge for disenchanted men looking for permission to act out their aggressive toxic ideals, we at least understood what Jack was acting out against. He tried normal life and found it unfulfilling, so he tries Fight Club, which in the end turns out to be equally unfulfilling. Similarly, with Train Spotting, Renton starts off as a serious heroin addict that rejects choosing life because, much like drug addiction, he sees it as merely a series of superficial, unfulfilling hits. Choose a job, choose a big TV, choose a family, etc. The difference maker is that Renton eventually does choose life, which comes with its own addictive trappings, seeing as when he gives up heroin, he has to subsequently give up his leech-like friends. And when Renton runs away with the money he stole from the drug deal, it's unclear whether or not his choice of choosing life is sincere. I'm cleaning up and I'm moving on, going straight and choosing life. I'm looking forward to it already. I'm gonna be just like you. The job. The family, the fucking big television, the washing machine, the car, the compact disc and electrical tin opener. By contrast, The Football Factory doesn't really have much to articulate about its characters and their world, because by taking away the baseline of normal, the film, intentionally or otherwise, frames their actions as the normal, which makes criticism of their actions somewhat impossible. And I think this is the real sticking point with me. In The Football Factory, I don't see criticism, nor do I see satire. What I see is indulgence. The Football Factory isn't insightful, it's stupid. The lack of coherent framing as to what the movie actually is sucks credibility away from the central theme, which the movie clearly doesn't believe in in the first place. The movie keeps asking of itself, is it all worth it, but it doesn't actually have the mental capacity to see through clearly enough and understand what that question means. Whilst we could probably talk for hours about the ways in which the movie half-wittedly criticises itself, the way in which it attempts to apply said criticisms without getting to grips with the real troubling aspects about the lifestyle it depicts, as well as its grungy exploitation movie aesthetic, and the way in which it reconstitutes juvenile criminal behaviour as jocular action movie mischievousness, I feel only really serves to try and make thug life seem more glamorous. Call me a spoil sport, please, it's my only sense of identity, but the Football Factory ultimately wants to indulge its macho power fantasies without thinking too hard about the implications of its actions, and I'm sorry but I personally find that irresponsible given the reality of the subject matter. And on that note, I call it case closed. I'm Matt Crowley, and that was the Football Factory. I'm not trying to pull you, even though I would like to. I think you are really fit, you're fit, but my gosh, don't you know it? <laughs>